Thanks to Paradox Arc, who've sponsored me to take a look at Stardeus today. An interesting game drawing pretty clear inspiration from some of my favourites. To set the scene, you're an autonomous AI on a colony ship that's come into a spot of bother. The stasis system is acting up and people are coming out of hibernation. So, with the help of these little drone guys, you need to bring the ship back into a working state and make a livable space for the people that have woken up so that you can continue the search for a habitable world. Because I suppose, rather predictably looking at the way things are going, Earth has become an unlivable hellscape. That's the ultimate goal, but I think that if I can just make the ship generally half decent enough to last about 100 days, I'll be satisfied for now. I named the ship Old Unreliable, which, to be fair, is an easy name to choose with the power of hindsight, but I like to think I'd have named it so fresh out of the orbital works anyway. Let's have a look at what we've got here. Various bits of spacecraft that were at one time connected, but aren't anymore. A small gang of worker robots capable of moving around and working in the vacuum of space, a whole lot of people held in stasis pods that are waking up early one by one, and a load of very useful things strewn around all over the place. My first act as king of this scrap heap is to start pulling two of the broken sections together and patching them up a bit. You can do so using these neat little winches. By what I will admit was pure luck, I got these lined up perfectly. The other large section here couldn't be winched in without reshaping the sections, so instead I just bridged the gap, since I'll probably need the space anyway. However, what's probably slightly more important, at least to the human inhabitants of the ship, is making the ship habitable to humans. There was a small sealed off area with two people already inside, down here at the bottom of the ship. But perhaps more important is the area surrounding the stasis pods, since that's where the new people will be popping out of very shortly. So I scavenged a heater and an oxygenator from other sections of the ship and installed them next to it, making that portion of the ship technically survivable, though livable would be a pretty serious stretch. Not that things were much better for the people over on the other side of the ship, a guy named Cricket very quickly went insane down there because, well, look at the place. Those planters, by the way, serve as both a food source and their toilets. I'll make things nicer for them eventually, but for now they'll just have to put up with it. I reeled in another section. It looks like a nice place for a command bridge, assuming I make it that far. This time I actually realised I could deliberately line up the parts to make the sections fit together really nicely, rather than just leaving it to chance. And with that piece pulled in, I would be able to patch up all the holes and have one big airtight space-worthy-ish vessel. It's still a deeply unpleasant place to be, so I focused my research efforts on human comforts like hygiene and food. Real luxury stuff. My rebuilding efforts were briefly interrupted by the arrival of a storage capsule, which upon landing turned out to contain a little Roomba, rather funnily named Bender. How the mighty have fallen, eh? reduced to cleaning up after humans with extremely poor diets and no toilets. The two habitable areas of the ship weren't actually connected at this point. People couldn't make it from one to the other without a spacesuit, and as a result, a few people did starve to death a little bit after waking up from stasis. I put a couple of planters in that section to tide the new arrivals over until I could make a safe pathway between the two human-compatible areas of the ship. And then another pod arrived, a stasis pod this time. Sent from a trader, it turned out. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, and I accidentally sent them back on their way without even looking at what they had to offer. Oops. The place was getting to be pretty heavily carpeted with human bodies by now, so I got my hands on a piece of machinery that could allow the inhabitants of the ship to serve even in death by becoming generic unrecognisable but oddly familiar protein chunks. It seems to be at this point, around day 20, that the game started to switch on the random occurrences starting with a short circuit when I went to connect a newly built charging port to the ship's power. It's not a big deal, one of the ship's robots immediately sprang into action and dealt with the issue. By day 25 there were a few extra folks walking around the ship, which now just had one big habitable area as the two smaller ones were finally connected. So rather than having them all just sitting around idle, I built a number of workstations for them. Crafting benches, looms, cooking stations. They were no longer merely living aboard the ship, they were also now indentured servants to the ship. And if that's not progress, then I don't know what is. The main issue though, aside from the ship being a generally awful place to live, was the lack of hard drive space. Which is irritatingly similar to my actual life as a YouTuber. You see, every technology you research is stored on your drives. To keep researching, you constantly need to build more drives to fill the computer's insatiable appetite. 
In order to start addressing the whole awful place to live thing though, I set up a small dining area with a large table and some chairs next to a refrigerator and drinks cooler. It's nothing fancy, but again, when you're used to squatting over a wheat plant, this is princely. Also, it took just under a month, but by this point the entire ship is airtight. So if I want to, I could fill the whole thing with breathable air and heat it to a nice balmy 21 degrees C. I don't want to do that though, because some of the machines actually output quite a lot of heat. And since they can be operated by the ship's robots anyway, it seems smart to just keep them in the cold vacuum of space and not have to worry about dealing with their heat output. A lot of the humans on board were still pretty unhappy, partially because they're mostly naked. Only one nudist is aboard so far and fair play they're loving it, but for everyone else's sake we started making clothes. Not space suits, mind you, just regular indoor clothes. And just in time too. Just as everyone was finished putting on their new pants, they were promptly filled with space diarrhea. Which isn't a huge deal, it just makes more work for Bender and causes the afflicted to be a little unhappy and generally preoccupied with toilet usage for a short while. Out of the blue on day 38 I was prompted that the CPU was steadily overheating, thus reducing its efficiency. The recommended course of action being a cooldown procedure, which essentially shuts me down and simulates just about a day of the ship running without my input. Things were going pretty smoothly on this occasion so that's absolutely fine, but I made a small mental note to build some radiators around the CPU to slow down the build up of heat in future. Next I wanted to build some particle collectors, essential parts for self-sufficiency in space, allowing the ship to gradually scoop up resources from the cold and empty void which can then be processed into all manner of materials. However none of my workers were skilled enough, requiring level 7 construction to make them. The solution to this problem is to build a machine learning booth, which workers can then be plugged into and trained in a selected skill. So I selected Brain, because it's called Brain, and set it learning how to do building more goodlier. It was also at this point I took my first look at the star map after building bridge controls into the centre of the ship. I set a course for the nearest planet, named Montezuma, and we very slowly made our way in that direction. Whilst on our way, the first hostile event occurred. A single raider emerged from a stasis pod and was promptly beaten to death by a gang of vengeful robots. It's a rough way to go, but that's what happens when you play the game. Further along the way to Montezuma, I couldn't help but notice a colonist named Infant standing at the bridge, fully nude. I was confused for a moment, since we're manufacturing plenty of clothes on board, but it turns out they're a nudist, so you do you, Infant. We finally arrive and are presented with the option to send an expedition down to have a little go at mining the planet for resources. I sent three robots, Brain, Vin and Gordon, which I think is all of my firefighting capable drones, but that's probably fine and unlikely to cause an issue. Five minutes later I plan to set on fire and naturally that fire started spreading to the surrounding vegetation. It's not a room often used by humans anyway, so it wasn't an issue to just close all the vents to the habitable area and vent the compartment to space, which I think stopped the spread at least, but the fire did burn for quite some time before finally going out. Rebuilding the room isn't a huge effort, so that could have gone much worse, I'm sure. I built a comm station to allow for ship-to-ship -ship communications, as well as a radar to give advance warning of incoming threats. I'm not sure what to do with said warning, but still, it's nice to have a moment to say goodbye, I guess. Warning came that the ship would shortly be bombarded by micrometeoroids, and then it was, so thanks for the heads up, radar. They absolutely wrecked the ship though, carving straight through in places, damaging the delicate network of electrical spaghetti I currently had connecting the ship's grid and causing so much confusion and delay. After patching everything back together I learned from that experience and began chucking reinforced plating on every external surface. I felt for sure I was ready for next time. I was not ready for next time. A shower of meteors came next. And these ain't no micrometeoroids, these are the real deal. Rather than cutting through the ship like their smaller, faster relatives, they blast out chunks, which can take some pretty serious rebuilding. But rebuild I did, despite having struggles with a couple of the production chains. I think I went about a few things in the wrong order here, because I'm really struggling with plastics, to make which you need crude oil, which has a very low percentage chance to be produced by rocks in a grinder. So okay, fine, I built some grinders. The problem now though was rocks. I had about 150 knocking about, but to be honest, I'm not sure where that initial supply actually came from or how to get more, and at this point I'm afraid to ask. And oh god, here come more meteors. 
this game has a real sudden sharp spike in chaotic energy around this point. There's a lot to manage out of absolutely nowhere. And wait, what's this? A random egg is on board. And it's, it's full of cats. Alright, that's enough. The ship works. These poor lost souls can navigate themselves to a suitable planet without me. Or perhaps they'll die in space a week from now when the cats transform. It's not my problem anymore. Whatever you do, do not go outside. For starters, there's no oxygen out there, but it's what is out there that you need to worry about. Until next time, thank you for watching. Goodbye.